Hi everyone. As I've said before, I will never ask for any financial assistance on this channel, but I will ask that you take a moment after the video to witness these two wonderful acts of God I am about to share. I'm reaching out for some support and assistance for our brother in Christ, Johnny Newkirk. Johnny has an incredible testimony, a true life of overcoming trial and adversity through drugs and addictions to losing literally everything, including his family and his possessions. Yet throughout it all, he found God, picked up his Bible, and has since been doing missionary work in Uganda and helping to do the Lord's work in spite of all he has been faced with. Johnny is just starting to raise money to be full-time in Uganda and to continue his work. So I ask, if inclined, can you please help support a true spirit-filled brother in Christ? Any amount, no matter how small, will greatly help to see this wonderful act of God fulfilled. Let's help Johnny reach his goal, for it is clearly God's will for his life. Another group that is close to my heart is Light of God in Darkness. They're doing some amazing work in Kenya and across the world. True soldiers for Christ at the grassroots level, working in the communities to strengthen their resolve and helping the needy in any way that they can. Please support these wonderful sisters in Christ and once again, no matter, no amount is too small. For those of us that live in abundance, let us help another. Praise God for his workers. Glory to God and Maranatha. Alright everyone, let's go. Let's, um, let's kick off this study on a positive note and um, let's have a look at Luke, Mark and Matthew today with a few hints of John and let's try and gain some understanding. So this is an exercise, okay, this is an exercise to um, help to unravel some revelation, help to understand who the books are speaking to uh, and also this, this is, you know, this is also pers personal for me to help me to grow in my understanding as I dig dig and dive into these things. Okay, so just a bit of housekeeping at first. Okay, I'd ask you to disarm yourselves um, in this instance because we've all learnt and have our own interpretations of the Bible. Okay, we all have our things that we've been shown, our personal revelations, um, things that we believe. Okay, so I, I ask that you, you know, casually disarm yourself here and just... Have your eyes open to other interpretations um, because to argue amongst each other, it's not what, what the Lord wants, okay? It's not what God wills for us. He doesn't want us arguing and fighting over these things, correcting each other. He wants us to help each other, to guide each other, okay? So I, I ask you, be open-minded and let the Holy Spirit guide you. Um, this is a study, Okay, this is not necessarily a teaching. This is just a study, a dive. Okay, we're going in and we're trying to make sense of. Okay, it requires you to seek confirmation in prayer in the word. Okay, let the word speak for itself. We're looking at what the word says. Okay, trying not to add too many um, guesses, too many, um, too much speculation. Obviously, we have to speculate a little bit for what's unknown. But we're trying to just let the word speak for itself. So what's in the word? Okay. So I ask that of you, if you could please do that. Okay. The, what's the purpose? Okay. The purpose of this is to demonstrate the books are speaking to different groups based upon their identities in Christ. Okay. So different, different groups. Okay. We see this elsewhere in the Bible as well. Some really basic examples. The, the seven churches, Paul's letters. Okay. We see them and we'll go into that as well. Um, they're the seven candlesticks, okay? So, um, and the stars are the seven angels of the seven churches, okay? We'll get into that in a bit later. We see this in Revelation. If you start diving into Revelation, you'll see all of a sudden there's stories from Ezekiel, from Zechariah, um, from the Revelation, from elsewhere, okay? All, all going into, all contributing to different, um, different details, so, for example, in Ezekiel, you know, he'll talk about seeing something and in Zechariah, he might give a one word detail that then confirms what Ezekiel saw, but gives more information and vice versa. This happens many, many places in the Bible. It's how the Bible is written. Okay, we must also, this, this is to demonstrate how we must analyze line by line in verses. We can't cherry pick the verses and just go, 
here's the meaning for this, here's the meaning for that. Each verse supports another, okay? The entire book has to be used in order to decode itself. Okay, it's very important. Each key word is a hint of knowledge that leads to another. However, we must translate correctly as well. So we have to keep in mind it's written in Hebrew and Greek, okay? We have to remember that the translations to English have different meanings, okay? So we also have to leverage Strong's concordance as well. And these interpretations can be subtle but can make a huge difference. Um, if you go to a channel called Ruger for Life, Ruger, the number four, and then Life, okay? Go to Ruger's channel and you'll have a look. He, he's provided some great examples of how the translations from Greek to English don't add up at all um, in the sense that they mean very subtly very different things. So we have to be very careful. Um, we must seek and continue to knock, okay? The Holy Spirit will guide us into truth. So this is a exercise of seeking. So we're, we're diving in, we're trying to find, okay? Um, but we're, trying, we're seeking understanding. So the more we seek, seek out the truth, the more likely we are to receive revelation. We must not lean on our own understanding, okay? We don't just think that we're clever enough to interpret this. Um, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit to help us interpret this. Um, but we also rely on each other as well. We all receive different pieces of the puzzle. We all have different revelation from God. So therefore, we must contribute and help each other. That is how this that is how the Bible will be understood. It won't be understood by one person, a group, um, etc. It, it will be understood if the body work together and the body work together, they'll get understanding. Okay, that's the point of it. We're supposed to all be working together. We also must ask for understanding. Okay. Now, I do apologize. This will be a slightly longer video than the others because we're going through the housekeeping. So what, we know, what do we know about the Bible? So we know the Bible's truth. It's God's written word. Jesus came into the world and was the word in living form. We know it's not written in linear order. An example, okay, this is a great example. Um, and things have multiple meanings. So the first will be last and the last will be first. Okay, so for example, Matthew appears first, Mark appears second, and Luke appears third. Okay, so the first will be last and the last being Luke will be first. So that means the order would be Luke, Mark, then Matthew. Okay, so we're going to get into that a little bit more. The Bible contains prophecy, has prophecy woven throughout its words, past, future and present. The is to come and was are used frequently. Okay, we're going to see that as well. The Bible must be interpreted with the Holy Spirit. The more we, the more we read and reread, the more we understand. The Bible must speak for itself. The Word speaks for itself. There are many translations, okay, which I've covered already, the Hebrew and Greek. The enemy knows the Bible. While the enemy knows their Bible, there are many secrets hidden intentionally. The enemy will also quote from the Bible, okay? So just because you see somebody with great extensive knowledge from the Bible, it does not mean that they are not necessarily the enemy. Excuse me for a moment. All right, I'm going to credit the first revelation that we talk about to a group called Ministry Revealed. So ministryrevealed.com. Uh, they're a wonderful group of people. And for the past couple of years, um, the head of the group has been really diving in and he was, he was, I'm not sure whether he was the one that found the first revelation, um, this interesting thing I'm about to show you, um, or whether it was someone in his group, it doesn't matter. That's where I saw it uh, probably about eight months ago. And for some reason I put it, I put it away. Like I, I was blown away when I heard it, but I put it away and then it came back to me just like a week ago. It came back to me pretty hard and fast. It just hit me. And then I, I started to remember and I went, oh, okay, right. That was important and I completely ignored it. So anyway, besides all of that, let's get into it. So the question is, who are these books speaking to? There are three different groups. All right. 
So I'm going to talk about, just ignore this, it tends to open everything as I minimize it. I'm going to talk about the three different robes, okay, and the three different colors. So this was the starting point the ministry revealed highlighted. So if we have a look at Luke, for example, in Luke 23, 11, it says, And Herod with his men of war set him at naught, and mocked him, and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate, gorgeous robe. In Mark 15, 17, And they clothed him in purple, and plaited a crown of thorns, and put it about his head. And in Matthew, And they stripped him, and put on a put on him a scarlet robe. Okay, so we have three different books. All th what the church is saying are three different perspectives, but we're all three different perspectives. Were they colorblind? Okay, were they blind? Because I don't know about you, but I could notice a difference between a gorgeous, like a bridal style color, like a white and a purple and a scarlet. All right, I would notice the difference there. Okay, and these discrepancies that we see in the in these books, okay, they go on and on and on. There's a lot of them, and I'm only just starting to dive into them now and learn them. So I'm I'm learning this as well, um, but this is important, okay, because what this does it opens up a completely different perspective when we read these books of understanding who who are they speaking to, okay, so. Let's um, let's have a look here. So, we've got the three, okay. We've got the saying: the first will be last, okay. So let's have a look at this. So everything has multiple meanings. So the first will be last, and the last will be first. It's an order of events, a prophetic timeline, okay. It's talking about the timeline. It's creating a timeline. Matthew in the Bible is first in the Bible. It's written first. Mark is second and Luke is third. But those who exalt themselves will be lowered and vice versa. So those who exalt will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. So it tells us here's a timeline. Okay, and we flip it around. Okay, so Luke comes first in the order of events. Okay, so who's Luke writing to? Who's in a gorgeous white robe? Okay, it sounds awfully a lot like a bride. Whereas when we see purple and red, okay, we see that in other parts of the Bible as tribulation colors. Okay, we see it as tribulation. So it really it makes you scratch your head a little bit, okay? So let's start start thinking about that. So who, who would this be speaking to? So Luke, Israel, Gentiles, first fruits, bride, okay? Pray to be counted worthy group. Okay, pray to be counted worthy. Luke 21, 36. All right, leaves before the seals and tribulations. The gathering seals work is third heaven. Okay, these are, these are some points that we're going to dive into and try and prove. Okay, we're also going to prove in, these, in this group here. Okay, so we're also going to prove in this group here too. And I'm going to put this down. Um, that some of each group, okay, only some. There'll be certain certain selected chosen people, okay. In Mark, that's the lukewarm church. It speaks to the lukewarm, the sleeping church, the great multitude, okay. So we're going to try and prove out that they stay till the end of seals, the first seven years, okay. So we're saying seven years. So. This is a completely different philosophy. Um, now, when we go back to looking at the seven years from for seals and judgments, we start to get this really squashed timeline of events. Everything just is overlapping and so tight. And so we're gonna, in this study, we're gonna try and prove out there's a lot more to happen, okay? One thing that's mentioned in Mark with these guys, they go to paradise, okay? So we notice with Luke, we get reference to the third heaven. With Mark, we get mentions to paradise, okay? 
And this re- refers to the rewards in the seven churches. So we can prove this out in what's said in the seven churches. In Matthew, okay? The unrepentant Judah, okay? So the section that's unrepentant, okay? Those that aren't watching, those that don't believe, okay? The, rem- the remnant of the Jews, the remnant of those that remain until the end, okay? The last seven years, trumpets, those that inherit the earth, will go through both seals and judgments, okay? So they're the different groups we're talking to. Now, we're not going to prove that out in this conversation, in this video, because there's so much, okay? This is the goal, okay? We're trying to demonstrate this. We're taking a somewhat a, uh, between a believing and a biased opinion. We're taking in the middle ground, okay? Because as we learn and as we go along, we might find things that contradict each other. And some of the sources I'll be using will be such as Ministry Revealed's work, Okay, which is very extensive and hard to understand. Very long videos. So I'm trying to cram it down into smaller bite-sized chunks. Okay. Today we're going to talk about the Last Supper. And we're going to use this as an example. Okay, so let's prove out here the Passover preparation that we're speaking to three different groups. Okay. So, and excuse my voice, it's just having to talk so much. All right, so in the Passover, in Luke, we see that the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew nigh, okay? It was coming up to Passover. The chief priests and scribes sought to kill him, for they feared the people. So what does it say in Mark? Okay, this, and I put how they start here, okay? So, so in Mark, it says, after two days was the Feast of Passover. So it's very clear it wasn't drawing nigh. Sorry, there's a spelling mistake there. It wasn't drawing nigh. It was after two days. Okay, it was different. And then in Matthew, it was after two days, the feast of the Passover, okay? And so what happened in, what happened with the words in Mark? The chief priests and scribes sought to take him by craft and put him to death, okay? Another little mystery there. I haven't quite looked into that one yet, okay? But straightforward here, the priests and scribes sought to kill him, for they feared the people. Okay? So, you could say it's just different terminology, but we'll see. Okay, but then in Matthew, the chief priests and scribes and the elders assembled in the palace of Caiaphas. Okay? So, it mentions this detail, so where they were. So, they were in the palace of Caiaphas. They consulted they might subtly kill him. Subtle, yeah, subtly, take him subtly and kill him. Subtly like a thief, okay? Take him like a thief, okay? Then, okay, so then we go back up here and we say in Luke, entered Satan into Judas, all right? We don't get that in that order here in Mark and Matthew. It doesn't happen in that order, okay? All of a sudden, now they're in Simon the leper's house, Okay, in this order here. It's different. Okay, so in Luke, the servants are basically saying to Jesus, we need to, we need to sort out the Passover and he sends them out with instructions. But this other step happens. Okay, so let's have a look. So what happens at Simon the leper's house in Mark? Okay, so he gets um, spikenard poured on his head okay, by a woman. We don't know who that woman is, but there was, but all the disciples were angry about it. They were saying, what is this waste? Okay. And he said, she's come to anoint my body. Okay, my body. Okay. What happens in Matthew? Okay. So they're at Simon the leper's house again in Bethany, poured precious ointment on his head. Okay, not spike nard. One detail is there, spike nard, but here it's precious ointment. We're given another detail. The disciples were upset about it. Poured the ointment on my body. She did it for my burial. But then we go to Luke. This anointment doesn't happen here. It happened way earlier. It happened in Luke 7. Okay, and behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, 
and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet and anointed them with the ointment. They were at the Pharisee's house, okay? They were at the Pharisee's house, okay? And then Jesus told a parable to Simon. It doesn't say that it's Simon the leper, it just says Simon. You know, that's, that's all we're given there. But when we go to John, and John confirms that this person was Mary Magdalene, okay? So she anointed the feet of Jesus. John confirms it, okay, that it was spikenard. He has all the details. He has both levels of detail. Anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment, okay? And this was in Bethany. It was Mary Magdalene. Martha served them, and this was after Lazarus was, was brought back from the dead. Okay, because Lazarus was sitting with them. So do you see how we're getting these different details, but we're also getting different store, part of the story. Okay, so I only discovered this this morning. Um, I knew, like I had this, I saw the difference with the ointments a while ago, but I didn't put two and two together that, you know, Mark and Matthew, they're anointing for his body. Okay, um, but they're anointing his feet for Luke, okay? So there's a very there's a there's a big difference there, and there's more to the mystery that we're gonna go through. Okay. So let's close that. Uh hang on a minute. So oh yes, yes, yeah, sorry, there's one more detail. Let me just go through this. Okay. In Luke, and he said unto them, Behold, he, this is when he gives them instructions for the Passover, where to eat it. Okay, this is really cool. And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall be a man who meets you bearing a pitcher of water. Okay, he's carrying water. Follow him into the house where he entereth, entereth in. Follow the man with water into the house. Who's the man with water? eats the Passover in the house. Luke does, okay? What happens in Mark? He sends forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, go into the city and there you shall meet a man bearing the water. Follow him. Follow him. Okay, you don't, you got to follow him. Follow the man, doesn't mention the house. Okay? Then, and wheresoever he shall go in, say ye to the good man of the house, the master saith, where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples. Mark eats the Passover in the guest chamber. It's very important, okay? And so we have a look. Luke gets to eat it in the house with the man carrying the pitcher of water, okay? Okay. But Mark is a guest. He's a wedding guest. Okay. So let's go to Matthew now. I haven't added this yet because I only just found this not long ago. Let's just have a look at what it says in Matthew at the end. Okay. So after he gives them instruction. Um, all right. So there's Judas. Unleavened bread. Yep. Going to the city. He must have said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciple, as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover. And then he starts talking about his betrayal. My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. Okay? That's very cool because... So let's have a look at that. Let's add that in here. Okay. So that's his instruction. Okay. He's saying, the master said, who's the master? My time is at hand. My time to die is at hand. I'll keep the Passover at my house with my disciples. He's not talking about saying, Matthew, I'm going to keep the Passover with you. Okay. This confirms Luke is invited in Okay, they're invited in to share the meal with him. He will eat with them. He'll sup with them. Mark, they can eat the Passover in the, as guests in the guest chamber. 
and Matthew, okay? Uh-uh, I'm not eating with you. I'm going to eat with these two, these two groups. All right, that, that to me is, that's incredible, all right? So let's, let's now have a look just at eating and sat with, okay? So in Luke, he sat and ate with them in Luke, okay? And he sat, said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. And he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave unto them saying, this is my body, which is given to you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup after supper saying, this cup is new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Shed for you, those that follow me, an act of love. In Mark, they were already eating. So in Mark 14, Jesus came in and they were already eating. He didn't serve them or eat with them. He sat with them. Okay, there's a very big difference here. Okay, in Matthew, in Matthew, Jesus came in, they were already eating. Okay, so let's see. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the 12. He sat with them. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. Okay, he took, so he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to the disciples and commanded them to eat. Okay, he commanded them to eat. He said, take this, eat this. There's no mention here, okay, of him eating. Okay, there's no mention of him eating. And he took the cup and he gave thanks. He raised it up and gave thanks. And then he gave it to them saying, drink it. Okay, he didn't say, you know, I love you. This cup is a testament of my blood, which is shed for you. No, he's like, drink it. Okay, he rebuked them. Okay, he commanded them. He's not happy with them because of their faith. And same in Mark. Okay, he's not happy with them. He rebuked them. All right, what else we got? So in Luke, in the Last Supper, right, he proclaims that he's a servant. But ye shall not be so, but he that is greater among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doeth serve. For whether is greater he that sitteth at meat or he that serveth. So who's greater, the one that serves it or one that eats it? Is not he that sitteth at meat? No, but I am among you, he that serveth. I am a servant, okay? I'm a servant of God, okay? He's a servant of God. He says that in Luke and he, he refers to that as a, as a trait of those he's speaking to. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Okay. He mentions that. Um, what does he mention that? He mentions that actually um, later on in Luke as well. And I appoint you until you are kingdom. He talks about the rewards. Okay. As my father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table. You can eat and sup with me in my kingdom and sit on my thrones judging the 12 tribes. Luke is talking to his bride. To those that he's happy to sit there and eat with, okay? There's no proclamation such as this in Luke or Matthew. He promises a reward. I'll appoint you a kingdom. You may eat and drink with me. And in Luke, he also says, which I'm kind of working on at the moment... He says he'll eat and drink no more until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And in Mark, I believe, and it might be Matthew too, he says that um, he doesn't say eat and drink. He only says eat or he only says drink in one of the others. So, so we see the discrepancies there, guys. Like they're pretty profound. Okay. We also see the discrepancies in the Lord's Prayer. There's a Luke version and there's a Matthew version. Okay. For his two groups, two groups, okay, of those that are his. Even though the second group's lukewarm, they have their own prayer. Slight variance in the prayer, okay? The bride says one prayer. The um, sleeping church says another prayer. Jesus on the cross. Luke. In Luke on the cross, Jesus said, Father, into your arms I commend my spirit. In, Matthew, in Mark, he said, My God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew, why, God, have you forsaken me? Why have you left me behind? Okay, they're shocked. Okay, he's, he's saying that because that's what they're going to say when they're left behind. 
Why did you leave me, Lord? Okay. So, we're just nearing the end now of the first part, the first video. Um, next video, I believe we're going to, and this could change, but we're going to dabble into the seven churches of Revelation, okay? Because it all ties together. We need to understand to prove this out, okay? When we look at the seven churches, okay, we're given in the Bible, the seven candlesticks with thou soareth are the seven churches, okay? The seven stars in his right hand are the seven angels, okay? Who, in, in Paul's word about the seven churches in Revelation at the start, all those different groups that he's talking to, okay? We're going to prove that it's a timeline, okay? It's a timeline. The candlesticks are a timeline, and we're also going to prove that not only are they a timeline, but they're a set of characteristics or a set of traits um, that are specific, okay, that are specific for um, certain groups of people, certain behaviors, certain actions, certain fruits, okay? So um, there's people will be extracted. There's you imagine how to candle, okay? This is the best way to describe it. You imagine how to tall candle. Now you cut some of those that candle off. Some of that candle, okay, is going to go down here. They're going to go through the tribulation. But that small amount of that candle that's going to remain, okay, there from that group will be selected then to be part of the bride or part of the first group. So there's all these different characteristics, but it's also a timeline, okay? And we're given this timeline as well. So the churches is a really complex one um, from, you know, I'm still starting to understand it, um, the double meaning, but everything that I'm seeing is that has this double meaning, okay? It, it, everything means if you start looking at things like, like for example, just before I finish up, um, if we go into chapter one of Mark, I believe, um, Matthew, let me just, sorry, just, yes, okay, so it's in Matthew, okay, for example, at the very start, the book of Matthew, Joseph's asleep, okay, he's asleep, he's completely asleep, he's not woken up at all, but he gets woken up, the angel wakes him up, and the angel starts giving him you know, the rundown on you're going to have a son and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. He's like, whoa, 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 okay. Um, he was asleep, okay. So there's there's lots of other parts of the Bible that support these notions. And if you look at John, John fills in a lot of the gaps. John has a lot of reference to Genesis as well. And this cycle, there's this big cycle, okay, and we're going to go through some of that as well. But let's keep it simple. Let's just look at these things very slowly. We've looked at the three robes, the three colors. We've looked at the Last Supper and the preparation of the Passover. We've looked at just some other examples like the Lord's Prayer and on the cross. There are many more examples hiding in there. Okay. But once you understand that these three books are talking to different people, it will completely change the way that you interpret them and you'll start to see, you know, the revelation that's in Luke. There is so much in Luke, okay, that's given. There's so much more detail of things um, and you have a look how it's written, okay? It's written to the bride. It's written to the first fruits, okay? So if you believe that you fit into that category, that's probably the one you want to really be schooled upon the best. Um, but, you know, you need to understand them all as well. So I'm still learning. I'm not saying I know everything. I'm just saying this is a study. This is the conclusion that I've come to. And it keeps opening more and more doors. Like, for example, the, the, the man in the alleyway carrying the water come into my house and sup with me. That only just hit me this morning. Okay. So, yeah, I hope this, um, I hope this has been eye-opening for you. I know I've been talking really quickly. I tried to keep this as simple as I could. Um, but I also try and pack in as much information as I could. And um, yeah, I, I've really enjoyed this and yeah, I'm happy reading and, um, and I'll try and um, 
get the next one out to you soon. All right. God bless, guys. Love you very much. And uh, Maranatha.